Okay, here's my intro. Let me just erase that right there and go simple. My name A Z. No, I don't like A Z I Z A K I B I B I. All right, we are here with another speaking engagement at Bergen Community College. Waiting for someone to come out and get us. Here, Moncho, take this. You got your thing, leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> like you're surely outside or not? <laughs> I don't know. I was getting Why do you look like she's stuff. a freaking drummer? I, don't, I swear to God, she looks like she wants to go I clubbing. Feel like, I feel like I want to put on some latex. Today we have our guest speaker, Mrs. Aziza Khabibi. She is advocate and a survivor here. So thank you. Let's give a round of applause for her. Thank you. Ms. Khabibi is the founder of and CEO of Precious Little Ladies Incorporated, which is a nonprofit organization that works to combat child molestation, sexual abuse, domestic violence, and essential abuse by stre strengthening, I'm sorry, I speak too fast, the bond between mothers and daughters. And now, without further ado, I present Ms. Kabibi. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Tony, for your lovely introduction. I usually just jump right into my story. Um, but I am going to start with the reason why I started Precious Little Ladies. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about Precious Little Ladies Incorporated. Um, it is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to strengthen the bond between mothers and daughters to combat child molestation, domestic violence, sexual assault, and incestuous abuse. And we do that through education, workshops, um, media, a lot through media and social media, and just basically having conversations. So I started the organization because I was molested by my father from a very young age. I was eight years old when he started molesting me. He started raping me when I was 10, and at 12, he deemed me his sex slave. So he taught me that my only purpose was to serve him sexually. My mom knew about it. She found out my father was abusing me when I was 10 years old. So. Our relationship clearly was not strong enough. She did not feel, I guess, a strong enough connection to me to choose me over her husband. She loved her husband. She also feared her husband. My father was abusive. He did abuse her as well as myself and what turned out to be eight more siblings because I include nine by my mom. I was homeschooled and I was only homeschooled till about 11 years old. 
cell through the process of the abuse, not having any contact with doctors. My father also limited our interaction. Well, actually, he ended up cutting off our interaction with extended family members. There was no allies that I had outside of my mom and dad. And I ended up getting pregnant at 15 years old. Over the years, I was impregnated five times. Four of them were live births. I miscarried one of them. And I did not escape my father until I was 24 years old. Yeah. Once, when we initially got away from him, we just lived our lives. We was just so happy to be free. Even though during the process, I lost my children to foster care and it took me three years to get them back. Uh, but by the time I did that, we were just so happy to be free. We didn't even consider the idea that one, our father was a pedophile, and there was a possibility that he could molest other children. So in 2006, we came together and we decided that we wanted to report him to police because we realized he was continuing to have children and those children were possibly in danger. Over the years, he's had a total of 21 children that we can count. This number does include my children, and it was just important to me, or it is important to me, to raise awareness and talk about abuse because it's often something, especially child molestation and incestuous abuse, it's often something that is brushed under the rug. And because we don't speak about it, our culture and our society do, do not speak about it candidly and openly, there's a lot of shame that comes along with it within families. There's a lot of shame that is put on survivors and victims. And even as a child within a family, there's a lot of responsibility that's put on the child. In my case, my father had me doing things, horrific things, in an attempt to protect my sisters. He said that if I was to comply, if I did not tell, um, and if I didn't complain, then he would not go on to the next sister. So that lasted for about four or five years, but eventually he did start molesting my other sister, and then he just went down the line. Um, he also told me that I would be able to go to high school one day, because I, I was very smart, very intelligent, and I really wanted to attend school. I wanted to have friends. I wanted to be a cheerleader. I think every kind of teenage dream <laughs> I wanted to have. But then my father told me that no, that would never happen because my purpose for him was to serve him sexually and then once I had my first child to then continue to bring his special blue blood children into the world. At different times, I fought back. That didn't turned out very well. There have even been times where I tried to poison his food, but I had a second thought. I also tried to run away multiple times, but I couldn't bear the, the idea of leaving my siblings behind to continue to suffer any abuse from him. So I, start, so I decided to stay and just do the best that I can. And then especially once I started having children, they were someone else for me to protect. Once I escaped him at 24 and we reported him to authorities in 2006, my father is now serving over nine years in prison. 40 for abusing my sister and 50 for abusing me. And then even as an adult, there was the question in New Jersey about the statute of limitations. Well, if I had been being molested and abused all this time, why then after 18, I didn't report it? When clearly it's not that simple. So thank God by the time it was time for me to testify against my father, New Jersey had lifted the statute of limitations. So, three of my children are here. <laughs> and I don't care about nobody else. I've been on this all through long, too long, too long. Baby, I've been on this too long. Wow. See? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why you think I fucking flow? I'ma keep on smoking till I can't hit another note. Yeah. Woo! Oh, but until then, I got you. Baby, I got you. One of my 
my children did pass away. She had spinal mus muscular atrophy and PKU, so she died to her genetic disorder. Um, my daughter, Moncho, also has PKU, which is a recessive disorder that affects the metabolic system, so she cannot um, digest the amino acids and protein. So her proteins, she, she has to eat low protein diet. And my daughter who passed away, she had spinal muscular atrophy. She passed away due to suspected complications. That's a whole other story because she was in someone else's care at the time that she passed away. And even though I miss her like crazy, it was something because my life was pretty much dedicated to caring for her. She was on respiratory support. She uh, was in a wheelchair. She had to get physical therapy. And that was fine for me. She was my baby. I loved her. I took care of her and I dedicated everything and all of my free time to her to just improving the qual her quality of life. After she passed away, I decided that I would try to live the dream that my father denied me of, and that was to get an education. So I put myself through college at 35 years old while working two jobs, <laughs> going through um, trial against my dad, and I graduated magna cum laude with two bachelor's degrees from William Patterson University in broad broadcast journalism and media managing the PTSDs that comes along with the kind of abuse that I suffered is, um, there's no map for that. There's no instruction book for that. So I try to use my own experience and how I have coped with what I have been through to educate others, hopefully encourage other survivors. <laughs> Sorry, I had to take a deep breath there. Hopefully encourage other survivors and educate them on how they can cope and manage. But honestly, the most important thing for me is to speak out enough to so that abusers can hear and that they can understand the impact that they have on someone's life and the intersectionality of, of between abuse and a lot of social issues that we deal with here in America, well, really across the world. In 2018, I went to <clears throat> Puerto Rico. I went to Vieques, Puerto Rico after the, after the disaster of Hurricane Maria. Um, I went with the William Patterson University to help them rebuild, give some encouragement to those on the island, but also raise awareness about abuse because specifically at the time of the devastation, incidents of domestic violence and sexual abuse had increased. Oftentimes it has been said, some research shows that men who are under stress tend to be more abusive. I don't give anybody an excuse <laughs> because you can either choose to react or you can choose to respond. Mm -hmm. And honestly, to take your stuff out on someone else, someone that you deem weaker than you, is shows your own weakness. Um, but it was a very enlightening experience because I had not been outside the mainland. I had not been outside of the United States. And it was so inspiring because even though there were people living in tents on their land because the hurricane had completely destroyed their homes. They still had so much love to give and so much positive energy. Um, and I could relate to that because I had been through so much hell and now just being driven to make the remainder of my life as positive and impactful as possible is really drives me and it's very important to me. And of course my children inspire and drive me too. So, And my motto is there's no such thing as a stupid question. If you don't know, you can learn. And we learn through asking questions. So. I really love your story. Um, and you're a brave woman to be able to share it with, with so many people. Having said that, I'd like to know what psychological uh, support measures have you provided for your adult children so that they don't look at it as a negative but expand on it as a positive so it doesn't happen to others, to their children, mm -hmm. and to make them feel good about themselves as adults? Um, I want to lead by example. Okay. 
so I lead by example. And my child rearing perspective is that I don't believe in, I'm pretty sure that this comes from my own experience with my dad, I don't believe in trying to maintain this parental superiority. I think that it's important that you are vulnerable with your children. So while, you know, it took me a little, uh, some time to tell my children who their father was. I told my oldest when she was about 13, 13 going on 14, um, just because I felt like it really wasn't appropriate. The, like I thought it was too intense. I didn't think she was ready, even though she kept asking me who her father was. Um, but then when I told her, uh, aside from her, her, I guess, shock of what actually happened and where she came from, at the same time, she is very proud. She was very proud of me. And she actually started talking to her friends about it before I started becoming public. Um, so, and, and I think that that has come from our open communication. You know, in a way, I grew up with my children. I was not in public, in the public school system. I was homeschooled. So it was exciting to me to see them go through going to class and pep rallies, and I was at every parent-teacher meeting. Um, and it was just an awesome experience. And, and we are very, we were, now that they're adults, it's a little different, but I made sure I involved them. So cooking dinner, they were sitting in the kitchen. My daughter was doing her homework while I was in the kitchen cooking dinner. We would have jam sessions. It was just a lot of interaction. And I think that just helped strengthen their own self-awareness and their identity, and it built a confidence in them. Um, they could tell you themselves, probably. <laughs> they could say if I'm right or not. But, and then as far as their mental health, yeah, communication is a huge, is a huge part of good mental health and good self-care. If something is bothering you, I don't believe in keeping it inside. Now, of course, there's a time and a place for everything, but, and there's also an approach. But, you know, if my, I've always encouraged my children, if something is bothering them, come and talk to me about it. If you've got a problem with me, come and talk to me about it. If you don't think something is fair, come and talk to me about it. And I do listen. I try to listen as much as possible. And <clears throat> because of this kind of brother-sister dynamic, one, because I was young when I had my children, two, I did lose them in the process of escaping my father, so I had to work to get them back three years. And then, of course, once I did get them back, experiencing having lost them, I just tried to make everything as fun as, fun as possible. <laughs> but um, definitely communication, definitely communication. And then from my own therapies, of course, I pass that on to them. Um, I we, we share spiritual experiences. We've meditated together. Sometimes it's hard to get them all now that they're adults in one room, but <laughs> we, try to, we hold family meetings, talk about their career paths. And it's just really about interacting with each other, not only as parent and child, but as friends as well, and just human beings. Great, thank yeah. you. Sure. Tying into what you said with like spiritual meetings and everything and meditating, how else were you able to overcome or how are you able to overcome the trauma mm -hmm. and PTSD and everything like that? So a, a lot of trial and error, one. Um, and also, I'm not afraid of the memories. I do find with survivors with this desire and drive to get rid of the memories and try to live a normal life. And me accepting that this has completely changed my path, what my path would have been. Um, and accepting that, then I can candidly address the issues that it has caused. One, my any fears that I had with dealing with relationships, with interacting with men and women. Um, I, I am honest with myself that those issues do exist and and I address them accordingly. So let's take a, a personal relationship, for instance. Um,